I'm honored and delighted to introduce one of the foremost computer scientists in the world. Leslie Valley has an extraordinary lifelong record of posing fundamental questions that have transformed our understanding of computation. Like, how should we measure the complexity of learning? His work on the probably approximate correct PAC model launched the field of computational learning, learning theories. He was the first to draw attention to the issue that counting solutions to a problem may be much harder than designing it, introducing the class sharp P, which then led to the study of approximate counting. Let's introduce the model of bulk synchronous parallel computing, which has had a large impact on how parallel computation is conceptualized and is said to have led to the design of massive parallel systems like MapReduce. His contributions have been recognized by numerous prestigious awards, including the Turing Awards. As the ACM Turing Committee wrote, quote, rarely does one see such a striking combination of depth and breadth as in Valiant's work. His is truly a heroic figure in theoretical computer science and a role model for his courage and creativity in addressing some of the deepest unsolved problems in science. So, let me introduce that. Good morning. Thank you for the extremely generous introduction. And also thank you for inv inviting me here. I'm excited uh, to be here. Um, so the uh, topic of my talk is probably um, different from what most of you do <laughs> all day. It's a bit different from what I, I do most of the time as well, actually. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit different. Um, so the advertised title is a technical uh, question in computer science, which are which has concerned me for a long time, which is basically that if you have learned information um, in your computer, how do you make it, uh, how, how do you reason with it, given that there are uncertainties? Um, and so in, in modern language, it would be something like, um, in these large language models, uh, we do uh, a lot of learning, um, and when we attempt to do reasoning, we excuse the machine for doing hallucinations, but you know, if you really wanted to make it reason better, uh, what would you do uh, rather than just do the same thing on, on a larger scale? Um, but uh, so this technical, basic technical question, um, uh, I've th thought about for a long time and recently I've started to understand where it fits into the broader picture. And uh, so really that's what I'm going to discuss. So this broader picture is a very broad picture which uh, um, it's still computer science, in my opinion. Um, it's the subject of a, of a book I've written, which is uh, about to appear. And so I'll describe what I have to say in those terms, although the advertised topic is in the middle somewhere. Um, okay, so, um, so this is something to do with uh, AI. So the first question is, um, if we're confusing humans and machines, um, as far as capabilities, is that a reasonable thing to do? And uh, so this was already asked by Turing um, 70 odd years ago. You know, can every task done by humans be done by a machine? And uh, so his uh, a fav a famous quote is that um, uh, you know, when you discuss this question, this, this was a radio talk, um, in a talk or article on this subject, uh, it's customary to offer a grain of comfort in the form of a statement that some particularly human characteristic could never be imitated by a machine. It might, for instance, be said that no machine could write good English or that it could not be influenced by sex appeal or smoke a pipe. I cannot offer any such comfort, for I believe that no such bounds can be set. So he already told us 70 odd years ago that everything which um, humans can do can be done in principle by a machine. Um, and he didn't, this wasn't just an opinion, but he basically deduced this from what's known as the church Turing thesis, which says that uh, com computers try to capture every process in the universe which um, 
is believed to be computational, and to the best of our knowledge, they do so successfully. Um, but uh, so this isn't uh, this is settled. Okay, so what's unresolved? So of course, after Turing, uh, progress in uh, was slow in AI, and so I th I'd like to focus on the issues that the issue of of you know, what is human capability? What are we good at? What is it that we have to simulate by machine? We have to state, and we don't know what that is. And also, in the end, we want to have algorithms for, for doing this. And uh, so the success story here is obviously the capability of learning by example. So this is a well-defined capability. And computer science is focused on this. And most of the successes of AI uh, are the successes of learning by example. Uh, but the question is, you know, this is clearly not all of human capability. What's missing? And how good are we at, at describing this? Um, so, um, OK. So let's think about intelligence. I suppose the word which comes to mind is intelligence. That's what humans are good at. But um, is that a good um, um, notion? So we are really obsessed with this notion of intelligence. So when we measure mental abilities, we call the result an intelligence quotient. Uh, when we attempt to imitate, emulate our faculties, we call it artificial intelligence. Some fear that machines more intelligent than humans would be an existential threat. And in searching the cosmos, we're seeking intelligent life. So you think we know what the intelligence is. Uh, but a uh, distinguished committee to ask the question of what intelligence is uh, decided that when two dozen prominent theorists were recently asked to define intelligence, they gave two dozen somewhat different definitions. So intelligence kind of didn't work out. So this was the American Psychological Association, which was concerned with, uh, with IQ tests. OK, so somehow intelligence uh, uh, hasn't served us well because we can't, we can't define it. People have tried. We use it, but we can't, we can't define it. Uh, so in some sense, this whole talk is about finding some notion which is uh, of that nature, but more useful. OK, so, okay, so the question is, how, how, do we, how, how should we ask this question about defining hum, human capability uh, better? OK, um, and uh, so remember, OK, OK. And so this, uh, okay, so I've written this book. It's got a title and uh, an author. Um, but I'm just trying to advertise the, um, the uh, illustrator's work. Okay, so the, this is the illustration on the outside of the book. So the um, arrow at the bottom is not a cursor on my computer. It's a picture of a cursor. And the arrow on the top is a Stone Age, a picture of a Stone Age axe. Okay. And then the question is, um, you know, how did humans go from one to the other? How did humans go from making stone axes to, to the computer age? So what was the cognitive capability which humans had to go from one to the other? Uh, you could say intelligence, but as we said, it's, uh, we don't know what that is. Um, so in all likelihood, uh, this change in a matter of tens of thousands of years is, is Probably not a biological change. So people have looked for some mysterious uh, genetic mutation, which would have uh, swept through the whole human population in this period and might account for it, but they haven't found any. Okay, so there are various other possibilities in biology besides, uh, besides mutations which sweep through the whole population. Uh, but in all likelihood, this, probably this capability is something which our ancestors have had for a very long time. And it just took a very long time to uh, um, get to where, to where we are. OK. Um, and so I call this the civilization enabler. So it's a capability which we have, which enabled us to create the civilization we have. And uh, so I'm still doing computer science. Um, and I want to describe this in terms of functions which are well defined. So in the terms of computer science, there's an input output. You have to define it. And uh, we want it to be computationally feasible. It should not just be pie in the sky wish list. It should be something which is computationally feasible, even if we don't know exactly how nature does it. 
Okay? So this question of what's special about humans, what, what's different about us compared to other species, has of course been asked by um, many other people in, in other uh, academic fields. So you can look at a website which has uh, 617 different topics. These are areas where academics have scientific work, where they distinguish us from our uh, near relatives. Uh, so what are these? Um, well, um, uh, I just want to emphasize that I'm looking for uh, not just something which makes us different from an other animals, but something which is a capability, something which is, enables us to make civilizations, which explains why we can do everything we can do. So for example, you know, eyebrows supposedly are unique to humans, but you know, there's no theory known which says that if you have eyebrows, then you can uh, make computers. Um, and there are all kinds of other topics which uh, anthropologists and others have concentrated on that in the history of humans, many things have been important. Domesticating animals has been important, but still it's not a capability which, you know, if you can domesticate animals, then you can uh, go to the moon, you know, there's no argument known. So there are many things uh, unique to humans which are important to us. So many people emphasize collaboration uh, we collaborate rather well. Of course, other animals do, do also. Uh, so most of these uh, single phrase uh, attempts uh, don't work out for many reasons, including that they're not very few, few things are really unique to humans. Um, social learning, which means learning from others, uh, important. Intelligence, well, uh, we don't know what that is. Um, so when we say symbols, language, then we are getting closer. So clearly, uh, humans is special to humans. Uh, but again, um, you know, saying that language is, the, is a capability which enables us to do civilization, again, it's hard to support because um, like if you teach a, a monkey to talk a little bit, it doesn't uh, make them want to uh, go to the moon, for example. So you want something which is more a capability uh, like learning, which uh, explains why, uh, explains the behavior which leads to uh, what we do. Okay, um, so, so I'll just uh, tell you straight off what this, uh, my proposal is. Um, and this, it's a composite, but uh, I think the components are important and then each, each component I'll uh, expand on in more detail. Um, and the, uh, this composite I call educability, which kind of suggests uh, what it's about, um, that you know, we are uh, you know, machines which are uh, easily educated. We're ready for education to, to be changed by, by our experience in all kinds of ways. Um, but the question is exactly in what ways. Um, so this, uh, briefly, it's composed of three things. Um, in a certain combination. And the first one is the thing which is so, so successful in AI now, which is that we can generalize from experience. We can acquire beliefs, behaviors, by generalizing from, from experience. And uh, this we know a lot about, you know, a lot of computer science theory on this, and enormous amounts of uh, experience. And of course now with these large language models, it's much easier to talk about this without seeming crazy that you know, with um, our understanding of, of machine learning, we do obviously get phenomena which are at least reminiscent of humans. So this is not a totally absurd um, quest, but what else is there? Um, so, um, so basically, you know, I, I claim that there are two main things you have to add. Um, and the second thing you have to add is this idea, which is through the title of the talk, is that if you have um, uh, these beliefs you've learned from experience, then uh, you, should, you should be able to combine them, which means reason with them, to, get, to reach conclusions in specific, specific situations. So this is a basic form of reasoning where you chain together uh, things you've learned from experience. Uh, so the idea being that learning from experience is very basic in biology. Biological things have been doing it from the beginning hundreds of millions of years ago. And once you've learned, uh, for example, that food looks uh, green 
and then uh, and that different color food is bad for you. You can ch usually chain together these things. It's natural to chain these together and do something more useful. Okay. Now, the, th the third thing, which is more particular to humans, is that we can also, uh, once we've got all this uh, apparatus in our brains to do all this, then we can also, instead of just being able to learn from experience, we can also be told something. Like we can be told a belief explicit, ex explicitly described to us by other, others. Which basically means that if you sit in a lecture room, someone can tell you their belief, you can take it on if you choose, but you don't have to have had the experience to, to lead to the belief, which previously other animals do. Okay. Other animals acquire their beliefs from experience. Um, it's, it's much rarer for them to be able to, uh, to be told something. Okay, so, um, so the idea that uh, you, know, you do a degree in theoretical physics, you learn this vast amount of stuff, um, none of which uh, is your own personal experience. It's all the personal experience of other people, scientists, down the centuries, and you can take it in, apply it, use it. Okay, so that's, that's the, th the third basis of this notion of educability. But the point, point is that the three together form a computational model and uh, has to be integrated. Um, we, we can kind of combine our personal experience with what things we've learned in a classroom. And also, all this is done in a, in a fairly rich environment, uh, which I call this multi-object environment, um, where you can do symbolic analysis. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. But the idea is that we can, as can many other animals, you know, separate the world into objects and relations. So numbers one to three have all got to be realized in uh, in a, in a certain rich enough uh, setting. Um, okay, so I'll say more about each of these. Um, so, um, so the word educability, I'm just, I, I am trying to, to suggest, of course, education, uh, about which I won't say very much more, except to say that you know, people, who've, people in, in educational philosophy tend to emphasize different aspects of learning. So um, certainly number three, which is like memorizing something people have told you is a big part of education, but uh, you know, of course many people say that doing only that is a bad idea. Um, so many people emphasize experiential learning where you, you, know, uh, you also learn from your own experience. That's number one. And uh, number two is like, is like uh, applying knowledge you've learned. That instead of just learning isn't just kind of like a, being a copying machine, that the knowledge lies in your brain, but you're ready to apply it to situations. Um, so the knowledge you acquire by either one or three is, is in a form where, you know, even rapidly you can just you know, look at a situation and you, you, can, you can apply it. So in some sense, uh, this definition does hit some of the basic uh, debates in educational philosophy and suggests that you have to, you know, you have to do all three, otherwise it's, an, it's not education. Okay. So, um, Although the actual the, the evolutionary timeline isn't, isn't important for me, um, I'll just make a, a, a suggestion. So the idea is that certainly generalization from, from experience is very ancient. All living things adapt to their environment in simple ways. So that's been there for probably a, over a billion years on, on Earth. And uh, certainly applying it in combination must be pretty ancient too because it's such a natural thing to do. Um, so um, once you can do this in this fairly rich descriptive uh, environment, then being able to, uh, to acquire some, some theory someone else has taught, taught you um, um, is the bigger deal, which is, um, which is the more human angle. Um, so I don't need to say exactly when our ancestors acquired this. Um, so our species is usually dated to about 300,000 years ago. And the uh, evidence is that you know, biologically we've been fairly stable since then. Um, and uh, so it's quite likely that um, this capability um, arose either at the beginning of our species or maybe earlier. Maybe some of our ancestor species were uh, smarter than we think. And so th that's uh, kind of uh, speculation. Okay, but that's roughly what uh, I have in mind. Okay, so generalization from experience. So this is, uh, 
what um, we know a lot about. So I'm just using standard uh, machine learning for this, which I think is successful in ex ex explaining the, the phenomenon, both experimentally and theoretically, and obviously gives quite persuasive results um, in producing lifelike uh, behaviors. Okay, um, but I'll just, um, to justify the model, I'll say, I'll, re I'll say a few things about this, some details. So, as we know, um, in, in machine learning, in learning from, ex from examples, you have a learning algorithm such as deep learning uh, or something much simpler. And the point there is that you um, train it, given some labeled examples, so maybe you give it pictures, some labeled as elephant or not elephant, and you produce a classifier, which is a program, and then later on, the, on the right-hand side, you can give new examples, um, which you don't know whether it's an elephant or not, and the classifier will um, make a prediction for you whether it's an elephant or not. Okay, so this is the backbone of most AI now. Um, so one important uh, notion, both experimentally and theoretically, is that you have to, this only makes sense if you know where the data comes from. So most simply, there has to be a data source or probability distribution, um, the mathematically speaking, which you train on. And then the test case has to come from the same or a similar distribution. Um, so if, you, if the world changes totally, then what you've learned uh, doesn't have to, uh, have to be useful, useful at all. Okay. Um, so, okay, so the probably approximately correct model is a theoretical description of what, um, um, of what is reasonably expected. And I'll just say a few words about why having a, a theoretical model uh, to describe what I'm describing is useful. I'm, I'll try to ju justify it rather than just some informal uh, notion. Okay, so in this model, the, you know, the blue circles represent all possible, say, pictures. Um, so some pictures do represent elephants, and their f of x is 1. And some are not elephants, their f of x is minus 1. So f is the grand truth. But in any complex world, the hypothesis, you, you have any hope of learning, will have errors. And this hypothesis h will differ from um, the true grand truth, there will be an error. And so the main hope, of course, if you, is that by learning you reduce the error. Um, but uh, the packed learning model emphasizes this in a particularly, uh, um, uh, let's say, efficient uh, way. Uh, so the emphasis here is, is that the errors decrease fast enough. So if big N is the effort you make in, uh, in the computation, in the learning, then you want the errors to decrease um, as you make more and more effort. So N is maybe the computational steps. And you want to, it to decrease uh, algebraically. Uh, so as a picture. So the idea is that um, uh, with more effort, you should make a better prediction. Um, but uh, the, it, should be, it, should be, it should be rewarded reasonably for the bigger effort. OK, so for example, uh, in particular, if you make 10 times more effort, if, if, you, if you make 10 times more effort and you half the error, then you want uh, in this criterion that if you make 10 times more effort, then you have the error again. Okay, so somehow you're always uh, adequately rewarded by making more effort. Um, so these graphs are shown, for example, by people who do the uh, training of large language models, and that does, does explain why there's this tendency to spend you know, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars on the training. It's just so tempting, you know, it's, uh, there's kind of a promise that if you, if you spend 10 times as much, your error will go down. You get smoother sentences in these large language models. So putting more and more effort into the training is, is a direction which people can't resist going, although it may not be the best direction. But it's kind of what theory and practice both support. Um, so just, uh, again, this idea of why do we do theoretical models rather than talk about it um, empirically. So pack learning is like a theoretical model, but supervised learning is like an informal term for a similar thing, so why not use that? So self-supervised just means it's supervised 
but instead of there being an external uh, supervisor who labels the examples, uh, the scene labels it. So in most of human learning, we don't need an external someone to label the scene. Our previous knowledge is good enough to label the scene. So I can look around and learn lots of things. There's no one labeling things for me because I can, my knowledge already does. Um, okay, so the pack learning model basically just explains generalization. So it just explains you know, uh, accuracy of prediction. Uh, but the problem is if you use less formal language, then you expect too much. Because humans, when we do supervised learning, we do all kinds of things. Um, so you know, we think that we can explain why we make a decision. Um, so uh, lifelong learning means that you can keep uh, you know, learning new things without having to relearn the old stuff. So you don't destroy your old uh, memories by learning new stuff, which is it's fairly difficult for um, most machine models. So adversarial examples that in uh, most uh, machine learning algorithms have low uh, security in that you can easily make, a, uh, make examples which your classifier will mis misclassify or the human wouldn't. Natural examples which um, look like an elephant, but you've changed it so the computer thinks it's a, it's a road sign. Um, so the, uh, the danger is that if you use informal words, you just you expect too much, maybe, and these, this too much you don't realize. So, um, you know, the, so these uh, deep learning is is trained to do generalization. That's all it's trained for. That's what it does well, and you may hope it does the other things, but it just doesn't unless you do something extra. Okay. So, so in some sense, the uh, formal models uh, more cleanly explain. Uh, behavior, because if you use informal models of cognitive functions, then um, then uh, we, we we easily can get confused with um, with our vague notions. Oops. Um, much, um, so what do here? Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, so in particular, as many people discuss, so these large language models are just trained to predict the next uh, syllable token efficiently. That's all. That's the only promise. Um, and of course, there's much work in trying to um, see whether they can do more of these things on the right-hand side. But um, it's hard work. There's no reason to believe that it does more. It may be just our our own hallucinations. Um, okay, so this is uh, uh, learning. Um, okay, so the second uh, second aspect of what um, um, second aspect of educability is that assuming we can we can do this uh, learning learning from experience, learning from examples efficiently, which, as I say, animals have been doing for hundreds of millions of years. It's only natural that we can do some reasoning on on, on the different things we've learned. So this um, is uh, kind of a bit of technical computer science where there's some, uh, some things one can do to make technology better. Um, but I'll just, just explain exactly what the system is. Um, as far as its uh, roots, um, so uh, Aristotle said somewhere that all belief comes from syllogism or induction, uh, where syllogism now means reasoning. And induction now means uh, machine learning. Um, of course, he talked about syllogism almost entirely in his work, but induction he acknowledged as being something which needed explaining. Um, so so um, workers in AI have uh, um, gone between reasoning and learning over the decades. Um, certainly when I started machine learning, uh, in fact, machine learning was really formulated as, as, as reasoning, and some people deny that we actually generalize. Because now things have swung the other way, and some people deny that we reason. People think that just by doing machine learning at a big enough scale, you know, we, can, uh, we can do everything which we, 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 we think of as reasoning. Okay, so the view here is that, you no, know, Aristotle was right. We have to do both, and can't ignore, ignore either. 
And the sort of, sort of real-world phenomenon I'm addressing here is that um, um, if you have multiple pieces of learned knowledge, um, so you've learned about food, uh, color, et cetera, et cetera, um, then each of these is uncertain. So how do you reason with this? How do you chain things together which you've learned differently, which have, which have errors? Uh, so most of, uh, certainly classical logic uh, doesn't allow error. And there have been various attempts to have logics which do allow error. Um, but um, they tend to ask for too much. Um, so in this cognitive framework, um, we're looking at, as in fact learning, we're looking at a world where, which is too complicated to actually model. So we, we never actually write down the probabilities of something happening. There's just too many. Well, it's too, uh, too rich in probabilities. Um, I can be, behave rationally and predict whether it's going to rain outside and things like that without knowing exact probabilities. So this is the framework in which one I'm looking at as far as, as, far as reasoning. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and so the system of, of reasoning with learned knowledge I call r robust logic. And uh, very, very roughly, uh, this is an illustration. So the, um, so the pure learning model is the idea that you know, maybe our brains are a single so a supervised learning box. So the um, caricature of machine learning is a single big network. You train it, and that's the end of it. So it's possible that you should view human, the human brain as such. But in robust logic, we do something else. We look at learning many different things. So for example, you can imagine, uh, say, each word in, in say, English, uh, you have a separate uh, learning box for, and you learn to recognize when that phenomenon happens uh, with, a, with a different learning box. Um, and, uh, and the point of this will be that the results of these different boxes will then chain together and you know, draw conclusions. Okay, so we can, do, we can do reasoning because we've learned, you've learned, there are many assertions which may be true about a situation and you can chain them together and reason. Okay, um, so, um, so in, in standard learning, you have some guarantees of generalization. Um, for reasoning, you, you need one thing more, which is uh, what's called soundness in logic. Uh, so soundness means that if you, you know, if I, uh, if I know that A implies B and B implies C, I want to be able to deduce A implies C. So there are some, some modes of reasoning which are guaranteed to be accurate, to be good, if I pursue. Um, but soundness will be a bit different in, in this context. And uh, very roughly, what it will amount to is that, um, so all our beliefs will be true only with high probability, say 99%. So if you chain together two rules which you know to be true to 90%, what can you hope? Well, you hope that it'll be true maybe to 98%. Okay, so soundness will be defined in this probabilistic sense. So I basically impose on, on logic uh, the basic semantics of, of, of machine learning. Okay, um, and that's about the best you can hope for. But you want to be able to do this in a principled way. So how is it, you know, are, are we sure that, you know, We've learned all this stuff, and when we change, what reason do we have to believe that we can, when we reason, given that what we reason with is usually informal, informal knowledge, and how do we know if you add two things together, it makes sense, you know, it gives us a guarantee, okay? So the point is that, you know, it's possible to get some weak guarantees of that, of that nature, and I'm saying that's important to pursue. Um, and for example, if you want to make uh, large language models which, which do reasoning in a, in a way so that you're more liable to, um, if you wake up, you know, do you type in, do you get into your large language model and decide what to do that day depending on what it recommends? You know, do you make life, life choices by asking your large language model? So I, I presume the answer is no for people in this room, <laughs> but if you wanted to make uh, uh, these large language models are a bit more reliable, a bit more kind of, you know, trusted by you, what would you do? Uh, and then you would have to do something like this, where when uh, there's some chaining to do, you have some reason to believe that it's not just, you know, making something up, okay? 
And that's, that's all that's happening here. Um, OK, so um, okay, so just a bit more about this robust logic. So the issues that you're facing, computation intractability. And one reason you're facing it is because we, we do want to describe a world which is quite rich, where we've got objects, you know, in the sense of predicate calculus. OK, so idea is that you wake up in the morning, you can fill your brain with a limit, limited number of, um, so, so these are called tokens as well. So these are um, objects you can think about with, which have no characteristic before you uh, thought of something. So you wake up, you think of your dog, your dog is sitting there, you want to please your dog, you say, what does my dog like? And then you pull out from your database of your brain all the stuff you've learned, and you may know that your dog likes, likes bones, okay? Now, in traditional logic, you'd have some uh, rule which tells you that you know, uh, dogs like bones. But in this world of uncertain information, where you learn everything, this is not what happens, <coughs> or we don't know how to do this. So, the, so the, instead of having a logical rule, um, we'll have a basically a, cl a classifier. So the left-hand side will be decided by some learning process. So uh, at the end of the day, um, in server logical rule, our knowledge will be of the form of some classifier. So the left-hand side is expression from a learnable class. So it could be a deep, a deep learning network. Um, it could be some uh, decision tree or whatever. And so we have a classifier, and this classifier predicts something, and maybe it predicts whether something in your picture is a, is a bone or not. Okay, so it's a predictor for bone. So we're back to the idea of having a different classifier for, say, every word in the, in, in the language. Okay? So you learn a classifier for, for every, uh, every word what you want to use. And then we'll, we'll chain these together, just like we chained, chained together um, logical rules. But the meaning will be uh, probabilistic. Okay? So the first notion is that we, we actually learn uh, equivalences um, okay, so we have an equivalence, not an implication, and the reason is that this is what uh, machine learning does. That if you learn to recognize elephants, you recognize elephants and also non-elephants. It's a two-way thing. Machine learning doesn't do implications, but you, you can chain these together, no problem. Um, so we will have some quantifiers in some weak way, uh, but they're kind of local there exists means that in the picture there exists something which is blue, okay? So there's a language. Uh, um, so the rules are learned, and the, uh, they'll be learned in the normal sense, but the examples will be these scenes. Uh, examples will be, one example could be that uh, my dog likes this bone, for example. And then from these examples are learned to, learn to generalize. So the, uh, you learn entirely from your own experience, and you know what you uh, what you see in your life is is what you learn from, generalize from. But in this fairly rich uh, environment, um, yes. So you um, the distribution you're learning from is your own experience. Um, and um, just uh, uh, some suggestion of the technical complications. So the uh, main issue is that we're really learning from partial information. So my dog liking a bone uh, doesn't describe much about when it was or the characteristic of my, of my dog. So the idea is that each experience you learn from, only a very small part of the world is described. Most of it is, is unspecified. So this is the real domain in which uh, cognition helps. It's not the domain of the standard machine learning where the idea is that you've got a picture and the pic uh, you're learning from pictures, and you predict pictures, and there's nothing, nothing else but pictures, OK? Um, so learning from <coughs> images to, to predict images is uh, like a complete uh, information system. But here is very incomplete. And I use the dollar sign for, su for suggesting that some um, uh, features are unspecified, OK? Um, so of course the um, upshot will be that if you if you learn if you learn in an incompletely specified world, 
where uh, you know, most of the things are specified, uh, then the um, conditions under which it's rational to, to, um, uh, to chain together two, two things will be if, in fact, these things are kind of orthogonal, that the things you've, uh, you've left out, the features which are omitted, you know, sh shouldn't be deciding, shouldn't be deciding factoring what you're predicting. Um, but you know, th this can be made to work out. And um, what happens is that in some worlds, you know, it'll just be too difficult to learn. You know, so you observe the world and you can't make sense of it. Okay. So the idea is that we only, we learn, tend to learn just the simple things which are learnable about the world and complicated phenomena which, which can't be predicted from the information available, you know, we, we won't. No problem. Um, okay, so uh, consistency not enforced. Um, so we just learn these things. We, it's like machine learning. We learn many different things. Whether uh, you know, two different chainings um, of rules will lead to contradiction in any situation. Uh, we can't rule that out. It may happen. It's the idea that you know, we humans live with contradictions. You know, we have beliefs. Who knows whether our beliefs contradict each other? We can even live. We can even even live with beliefs where we believe no contradict each other. We just <laughs> carry on. Um, okay, so this is roughly the the um, um, feature. Okay, so so the last feature I should emphasize um, is that um, so for this learning um, of of many uh, concepts like hierarchically. Um, uh, that's got some difficulties, and basically, uh, to make it work, one has to assume that the, the labels are correct. So it's a bit like um, if you only uh, you know, half understand a concept, like a math concept, you, you only half understand, and then you go to your next lecture, you try to use that concept, then you, know, you don't do too well. So this really relies on the fact that, um, say, as in a, in a human lecture course, you know, the instructor had better not make too many mistakes and better you know, label things correctly. And um, so even if uh, you only have a partial understanding of the concept, it has to be an accurate label in uh, a ground truth label. Okay, so, um, okay. And then what you can, uh, um, okay, so the main result you can prove is that the chain of rules is sound in this probabilistic sense. Um, you know, that there's some justification for training together to rules which you're confident about. And um, so tractability is also, Im oops, is also important. Um, so basically I want everything to be polynomial time in, you know, so, how, so like how many tokens can you have in your brain? It's polynomial in that actually. Um, and you know, how many rules are you learning, the size, et cetera. So the only thing which is where it depends exponentially is on the arity of the relations. So you have to break the world down into with relations of you know, constant arity, like you know, two or three. So for example, um, if I think of people in the room, maybe having a relation which says people on the left, people on the right, that's simple enough. I can deal with that. But I can't have some relation which really depends on, on you know, details of all the individuals in the room, you know, where there's a prime number of people with blue shirts, you know, that's too hard. Um, okay, so, um, so just as an, as an example, this is an experiment done a long, long time ago. Um, so the kind of, uh, um, so if one implements this robust logic, uh, then you, um, Okay, so this was done on a long time ago. The famous Wall Street Journal database of articles. This is articles about business. Um, so with Lois Michael, uh, then a student, uh, with some natural language uh, stuff on this. But basically, um, we were trying to predict notions to do with business. So this was a question of whether uh, a missing word in a sentence uh, meant price. So the game here was uh, instead of predicting the next syllable, like large language models, here we delete a word and try to predict what it was. So this is a AI problem where there's a ground truth. And so and we used a simple learning algorithm which learned linear separators. 
<coughs> and so we learned some rules which uh, seem to uh, learn from the data facts about the world. So for example, if we can decode this uh, linear separator, then this um, uh, compound feature said that um, um, if something lowers the price, lowers something else, and there's something to bargain, so what does a bargain lower? Bargain lowers price, okay? So, so this was a, so, if, so if, if there was a fragment of a sentence which said that a bargain lowered this missing word, then saying its price was some evidence for it. And there could be some other evidence as well. Competition also lowers price. So here we were trying to learn from uh, natural language uh, ways of, um, you know, ways of predicting whether a missing word was, uh, was, was price. Okay, um, so there's some evidence that this, that doing this, learning many words, many concepts separately, uh, has some advantages over having some simple big unit which try to learn everything in parallel. Okay, so, um, so I want to finish uh, uh, this section. So as I said, this second aspect of educability is chaining, chaining together um, um, rules we've learned. And again, this has some theor theoretical basis. And, <clears throat> and also one can make some very, very claims that pursuing this approach over this approach would possibly contribute to some of the uh, un unsolved problems in machine learning. So for example, um, you know, so lifelong learning means that you can learn new things without destroying the old stuff. And certainly here it's clear that you can learn a new box without disturbing the previous ones. Um, also explainability. Um, so explainability means that if you have an opinion or something, something someone asks you why you, know, <clears throat> you bought a coat today and you say it's, you think it's gonna rain, um, then uh, we can give some explanation. Um, but uh, so this takes the view that you know, extracting, extracting an explanation from a big box is kind of difficult, kind of hopeless. Um, but if your cognitive process already works with many boxes and each predict different things, then all you have to do when I ask you why you bought your coat, is, is to read out you know, your assessment of everything else, okay? So if you thought it may rain today, then the rain thing would be on, and, and you know, the fact that you bought a coat because it's gonna rain is explicit, explicit here, whereas who knows how to find it in there. Okay, so this kind of architecture is much more natural for humans, I think, and does uh, solve some of the problems of learning. Anyway, okay, so um, okay, so so this is the second the second part of um, of educability, which I've tried to go on to some detail. Um, but let, let's unwind and go back to, to go back to the story. Um, okay, so as I said, my notion of educability is this is this combination of learning from experience, chaining together what you've learned, and then the third big part, which is the most big, uh, particular to humans is taking instruction from others. Um, so, you know, so the basic, so with this, um, the idea is that um, assuming we had this previous architecture, which I've described up to now, learning, chaining, uh, mind's eye, multiple objects, then supposing suddenly uh, you also got the ability to, you know, put a program in which and a rule which tells you what to do exactly in, every situa in some situations. Tells you about special relativity. This is what happens, okay? Not what you've learned from experience. Um, so, um, so this is, uh, I think, the third part of educability, um, which is to be able to execute programs which someone has given you, and by program, a recipe, method, instructions, whatever. But they're given ex explicitly, you know, you're, given to told, told in a lecture course, for example, exactly how to do something. Um, and you have to take it on trust. I mean, uh, you learn too much to be able to check everything out for yourself. Um, so educability is the integration of all, the, all of these things. And uh, so, okay, so a bit in summary, so there are many things you can uh, say about this. Um, 
So if you take this seriously, so if you think this is really what's special about humans, then you know, many things you can read off and you can agree with or not. Um, so the upside is uh, what's um, in some sense often discussed in, in other terms. So obviously, um, if I can tell you something which I've concluded from my painful experience, it's very efficient. You can tell 100 people at the same time something which you've you've discovered. Um, so certainly science has developed this way. Um, so in science, a single person can learn things which were discovered by thousands of individuals over centuries. Uh, it's an amazing ability, and this all follows from the idea that we can take instruction from others in this fairly rich domain, and also integrate it with our common sense, okay, which is, well, okay, so, um, Okay, so this allows us to develop a civilization, have a, have a broad culture. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> but, um, but also, just to mention one, the one downside, so which um, you know, hadn't occurred to me before. Um, so the idea is that before you add this, um, being able to take instruction from, from others, everything before is all based on experience. Okay, so I have my experience, where to find food, where to do this, where to do that, and I fit my belief with, with the real world. Okay, so it's, it's very grounded. It's, you know, so if I evolve to be able to recognize my food, you know, it's, it's good for me. I've evolved to, to, uh, to do just exactly what's good for me. Um, so this learning and training, the behaviors are grounded in experience. So this is how most animals in the world uh, go. But um, with this educability, we can do this amazing stuff in science. Um, but um, it appears that we don't have a very good uh, ability to verify whether what we've learned is, is true, okay, or valid, or, or real. So again, in an educational setting, we just have to take on trust that you know, the IIT has our has a, uh, um, interest, interest at, at heart. And in fact, I think it's probably a very basic human thing that we don't seem to even care so much what's true or not. So we watch movies, we read novels, and we don't care that much whether it's a true story or not. You know, it's got to be fact, fiction. You know, we, we, can, we can absorb both, okay? So, so, this, uh, so it's, of course, very difficult to verify whether a complicated theory is, is true or not. Um, and you know, it's, it's not a, a particular... A weakness of us, it's just difficult to do, I think. Um, and um, okay, so we are, you know, so certainly we're easy victims of arbitrary beliefs, ideologies, conspiracy theories. Um, and um, so, as far as what to do about it, so of course, many people are discussing what to do about you know, deep fakes in, in, and where various ways of misleading people. Um, but probably the Difficulty is, is, is more, is deeper, that we're just, you know, we're easily fooled by traditional means as well. So maybe there's some hope through education to actually harden individuals to be more critical of everything, that, everything they hear, to harden them against propaganda. And both are traditional and digital means. We're just bombarded with so much information that um, we're not well equipped with, with, with dealing with this. Okay, so this is just uh, a danger. Um, okay, so uh, just to finish. Um, okay, so just an illustration of, of the last point is that. <coughs> okay, so this is our environment. So we, we live in a complicated world, um, but when we do um, basic uh, learning from examples or even reasoning with it, we're still grounded in, in the world because we we have learned from experience and uh, you know, uh, what's in our brain reflects the real world the, to the extent we've managed to learn from it. Whereas if we're, if we're um, ready to accept a program from someone else, then we're at their mercy whether this program fits the world or it's just, uh, just different. Okay, so um, obviously the, the, the power of this is that we can really learn things which you know, thousands of people have, have learned through science, and we have no chance of verifying, but you know, if they're right, then we, we enjoy the benefit of, of their knowledge, um, but we have to trust them, okay? So 
education depends a lot on trust. Um, okay, so, okay, okay, so this book is called The Importance of Being Educable. Okay, um, okay, so, um, okay, so just I've got the last slide where there's some other issues which are raised if you take this uh, seriously. Um, so the first point is that, um, you know, many people advocate that education is very important. If you believe this model, then it says education is, you know, is, is, is what we are. Okay, we're machines ready to be educated, so it's, a, it's so central in us that it's not just, uh, education isn't just something we spend a few, a few years of our life doing, it's, you know, who we are. Um, um, so uh, a couple of other points which would take uh, a long time to discuss, um, but, um, so with Turing machines, we know that they're kind of, they're believed to be the maximal of their kind, so no one thinks, oh, pe people don't believe at, at this time that um, there are machines which we, sh we, sh we should be looking for, which are more powerful than Turing machines, except possibly by efficiency. But that in computation, we believe at the moment that we're comfortable, we, we know what the maximal, uh, maximally powerful model is. Um, so for this, this educability model, again, one can ask similar questions. It's a bit a loose question, but the question is that it may be that these are the, what I put in are the main features which you want to put into a cognitive model, and there isn't something extra we should be looking for which does something totally different. Um, and if this is true, then it, it does uh, kind of answer the third issue. So a uh, very widely discussed issue now, of course, is whether, you know, we should be looking for a singularity when computers take over from humans. So there are various arguments that um, if you get machines which are more intelligent than humans, then they'll take over. Um, so, so most of these arguments as stated are kind of false. For example, if they're based on intelligence, then you know, we don't quite know what intelligence is. But uh, I, mean, I think a more general point would be that, so certainly machines will, every defined capability like chess, Machines will do better than we do, okay, if you define it. Um, but it may be that machines don't do anything of a nature very different from us. They just do it more efficiently. So if you make a good chess playing machine which does search, we can do search as well. Machines can do it more efficiently. Um, and so probably, you know, I suspect at this point that um, these basic uh, properties of educability is, is, is what's out there and um, machines will do various aspects of this, and many things it will do better than we do. But don't worry about it. It's not a total game changer. They'll just be better at us than in various things. It's, it's, there's no singularity, you know, I worry about, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, and a more human uh, question is, <coughs> so the educability is a pretty, you know, cleanly, cleanly defined notion. And you know, presumably, you know, we're all good, we are able to do some of it, um, but certainly a good societal question is whether our ability to be educated can, can be enhanced. Um, so certainly, of course, many people discuss similar things that you, you, you learn to learn, but this is a more specific uh, definition. So the question is, are there, uh, so it may be that some existing interventions like you know, uh, early childhood education maybe is, is good for <laughs> enhancing educability. Okay, so lots of things may be possible, but if we, we may be able to pursue this question and, you know, make ourselves more educable. Um, okay, so these are some general issues which, which arise, and uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, any questions? Anybody have questions? Yeah? Yeah. You said at the end, uh, you said at the end, uh, it's okay, there's no singularity, uh, don't worry, and that's probably my next time where I can have it. Um, so, so to more quickly, um, you know, the quote of Turing, which you said in the beginning, so you said that machines can emulate everything that humans do. Um, so, so the singularity can come from the fact that machines can do it 100 times faster than, uh, than humans do. That, that would really change uh, the case. That would possibly right? <clears throat> no, I'm, not, I'm not, not so sure. I think, uh, so I think, 
There are you know, many different act activities we, we do. Um, chess is one, there are thousands of, of others. Um, and uh, so if you, specify, if you characterize each one, probably you can make a machine which is better than us. Of course, we can always say, well, uh, you know, we're, we're not interested in that anymore. We will stop playing chess, we'll do something else. Okay, it's our choice. Um, and so, I mean, we all obviously have to keep in control. We won't give control to these machines. Okay. Um, don't do that, certainly. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, but fundamentally that they'll, uh, uh, so unless you make a bad mistake, uh, because there are lots of ways we, humans can make bad mistakes. Giving control to malicious machines is, just, is only one. Okay, but have I answered your question? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's <coughs> certainly a, a great question. Uh, so, I mean, the only thing I, I say about that is that, um, um, is that most, uh, you know, many acts of creativity are combining old thing, two, two old things, or making some distinction between an old thing and making it into two separate notions. So these things are, are within the formalism. If you're asking me, you know, why are some people better at this than others, that I do not know. <laughs> okay, so, um, but, um, but I'm, I think I'm concentrating on, on this ability, which I think all humans have. And, and so it's a study of, of something we all have in common. Okay, you can study, you can study things which are very rare, uh, but that's not what I'm doing. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yes, but uh, you know, one can say that um, what um, yeah, I mean, without taking away from Einstein, you know, he, he in some sense what he was pursuing was a very simple idea, but he was pursuing it relentlessly. He chose it with obviously amazing taste, uh, so he, he knew he chose his problem well. Um, and so how people do that and choose a scientific problem so well and have the character to pursue it so well, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't, uh, that's outside the scope of this, but as are many other things. Okay. okay. Thank you for the highly heartwarming talk. Thank you very highly heartwarming talk. I have two uh, small questions. One, you mentioned about this model. Is it the... Is it completely? Is it completely? Is it complete? I mean, uh, is it, it seems like from the argument you made, it seems it's necessary. Is it sufficient? But uh, so it's sufficient for what? For? Uh, to answer the basic question that we started with, uh, is this the fundamental block uh, that led to the civilization? Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, <coughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I, so at the end, I asked this question by saying, is it maximal? Okay, that's not yeah, yeah, that, that is, there, is there nothing else out there which is of this nature which we, which we need to add? Um, so, yeah, so in broad terms, I'd, uh, uh, yeah, I, I conjecture it's, it's maximal. But, but uh, you know, there, there are many parameters of the model which, um, it's, it's a mathematical model, but it's got some parameters. So, for example, one parameter is, is, which is true for humans is, if, if you take in uh, other people's theories, uh, who do you believe? Who do you prefer? So that's a parameter of the model. It's only a model which just believes everything, you know, won't work, okay? And there isn't a universal answer for this, so, so humans use sophisticated ways of deciding who to trust, you know, people in authority, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, um, yeah, so this question, uh, yeah, of how complete it is, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, in very rough terms, I'm suggesting it, it may be complete, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's totally complete. <laughs> okay. Any other questions?
Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I, do, I don't want to uh, deny the importance of language. Uh, I, I'm, I was saying that language by itself doesn't um, uh, it doesn't explain the capability, isn't isn't a capability. Okay, so the um, uh, I'm, a, I'm defining a capability for which language is, becomes uh, very important. Okay, so if if I want to take instruction from others. Certainly, language is a very good way in which I can get the, the get the instruction transferred. I mean, there's some evidence that you know, for animals, you can transfer also instructions by demonstrating physically. Okay, so language isn't isn't absolutely unique, but obviously it's it's important. So, so okay, so I, th I think in summary, I'm not denying the importance of language. I'm saying it's uh, something which is needed for this educability educability to work well, and and just by saying language itself doesn't explain anything, okay? I want to explain the, the capability. Uh, I think you need the capabilities I'm describing. Um, and uh, so these are, these are the capabilities of the individual. Um, you're right in saying that when I say I can take instruction, I need some medium in which the instruction is expressed. You're, you're correct, and language is good for that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the importance of language, but uh, one also has to say everything which I've said, I think, too. Uh, answer the question. Yes? Yes, sir. So, just one small addition. Uh, but then, someone like Chomsky, of course, most of his uh, innateness hypothesis and other things have been disproved to a degree. Uh, but the question of poverty of the stimulus, uh, the fact that we learn so much language from so little exposure, uh, it does point to language being a cognitive capability in human beings to an extent which animals don't show. So wouldn't you call it a capability in that sense? Well, um, you know, whether the, what you're saying is whether I, I, I agree or not uh, with, what, with what you said, I'm, I still don't think that language is the capability I'm looking for. It's, it's, it's not enough to explain. Uh, I think you need these cognitive processes of learning, uh, reasoning, uh, and being able to incorporate in your, in your knowledge base what you've learned from others. You need to say all that. Um, in addition, you're right, that one has to stay, say what medium you're acquiring these, this knowledge. But um, I, I don't need to answer your question. If you, I don't need to take a question on your question. Yeah, I think, uh, we have to 